All right, man. Welcome to Crow 777 Radio. This is hour one of episode 591. It's me and Jason today. We're going to be talking about basically what people like to call the new world order. What does that mean? Well, we were just making the joke before we pushed record from the old movie, there can only be one. Every merger you see in the world, every buyout you see in the world is one step closer to what people like to call the new world order. There will come a point when everything is under one banner or the control of one banner, although the appearance will probably be different than that. But above the companies and corporations that are controlling everything will be that BlackRock or whatever it is. I think a lot of people claim that it's down to three or four. I've been of a mind that it's maybe one or two. And I've been of a mind that that's true, just to point out the power and the sway that they have. Other people who are in the know tell me that there are factions which actually, in my view, wouldn't be a bad thing. Maybe they'll get mad at each other and do damage and set things back. Who knows? But as we jump in here, uh, I'm going to sprinkle in a lot of information that I've been able to vet recently through sources, some of which who have firsthand knowledge of how closely the banking is to almost every facet of what we're going to talk about. The day that the Napoleonic thing went down and the Rothschilds lied about the outcome, took over Lord knows how much banking and money on that day was a massive shift with regard to how the future was going to play out. Anyhow, welcome, Jason. And a hot and humid good morning. It's not too bad here. We actually cooled, but we were hot and humid the entirety of the month of June. Typically, it's like three weeks in August, but we seem to be cooling down already. I made the realization that the last two Augusts last year, the year before that, was when the two HVAC systems died. Last year was the big one in the house. The year before that was the one in my studio. That's a drag when that happens. I'll tell you what, I set up to film yesterday morning and I was up and running by about 8 a.m. And it was some of the clearest, best seeing that I've experienced uh, after a rain and after all the humidity is gone. But I'm pretty excited. I just got a automated filter wheel for the scope, uh, some colored filters, some cut filters, and uh, a Barlow, which is basically kind of like a magnifying glass to think about it. And I'm getting real excited about what I'm going to be able to pull off. But man, I rue the day when I can get these tools on the sun, the other sun, the second sun. I'm convinced I can bring it into focus. I'm convinced that I can learn more than we currently do. But anyhow, shall we jump in? How far along are we on the way to a one world government? Who wants and is pushing for a one world government? This seems to be something that has been in the works going back to at least the late 19th century. Numerous luminaries of the time had various plans that were being put into action to destroy national sovereignty in the world's nations and drag them all closer to what H.G. Wells called the New World Order. The first attempt was made with the League of Nations in a post-World War I era, but too many nations were still very much wanting to keep to themselves. The second attempt came post-World War II with the United Nations. With their main headquarters in the city of New York, on land purchased and donated by John D. Rockefeller Jr., the United Nations has worked alongside numerous other organizations, such as the Club of Rome, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Trilateral Commission, to help bring the world's nations closer and closer to a single authority, under the direction of the world's top bankers and banking institutions. As so many of these globalists will say, It's not global government, it's global governance. We will explore what steps the major power players in the world are taking to accomplish their goal. It's getting close, isn't it? And how did this happen? Well, the richest in the world bought things, merged things, hand over fist. This has been going on and they kind of feel, I think, at this point that they own so much that they really can't be stopped. I really do think that is their mindset. And Jason and I were talking about the movie Ready Player One. My point of view of that movie, beyond the message it seeks to supposedly deliver, which probably isn't far off, by the way, how many copyrighted things were thrown into that movie? You know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, the bill to pay on licensing and copyright would have been astronomical. But now, 
the message they want you to believe as well. It was this company and they already had a good chunk of the rights and this, that, but unfortunately they couldn't get Star Wars. They really wanted it. That's not really the point. The point is a movie like that could not have been made before the consolidation of so much power by the bankers at the corporate level. And Jason, I want to run a thing that you and I put forward some time ago that I recently just reposted, which is a very important piece of information that people can look up. It tells people one of the tactics that has been used to put us all freaking asleep while they literally take over the world. What I'm about to read you is a speech that was given by Montague Norman, the governor of the Central Bank of England, which our central bank is modeled on partially, And he gave that speech to the U.S. bankers in New York City in 1924. Listen carefully, particularly if you are still under the red-blue mind spell, particularly if you still are caught up in the political trap that it was designed to be and implemented as such. Here we go. Mr. Montague Norman said to all those bankers in 1924 the following. By dividing the voter through the political party system, we can get them to expend their energies in fighting for questions of no importance. It is thus, by discreet action, we can secure for ourselves, the bankers, that which has been so well planned and so successfully accomplished. What more do you need to know in this lifetime? He's talking about the supposed home of the free and the brave, the supposed democracy, that beacon of liberty, America. He's saying us bankers came in and made up this red-blue thing to warp all the minds while these careful plans we've been laying for over 100 years come to fruition. And look where we are now. I guess I don't remember what episode we ran that, Jason, but it's a pretty big deal. We've mentioned that a few times, and that's quite the quote. It's good to keep reinforcing that. As we go along here, I'm going to throw information in, and I'll tell you right now, any information is questionable, of course. I vetted it to the best of my ability. This all started with things like James Shelby Downard, the work of Michael Hoffman, Daniel Estelin, that one book about Tavistock, certain areas where he's referencing studies and other things and citing them a new book called The Saudi Swindle, my friend, who I guess I won't name, who has firsthand knowledge of such things. That's what I will use. I'm not going to explain it very well. I'm going to put it out. It's informational. If I say it, it means I said it because I currently accept it at some level. According to the World Economic Forum, global governance is defined as the following. Global governance functions through a set of institutions, rules, and processes that aim to manage cross-border issues like diplomatic relations, trade, financial transactions, migration, and climate change. It seeks to address collective concerns and mediate common interests, creating both privileges and obligations for the public and private sectors. It is also essential for solving shared problems, pandemics, wars, and financial crises. It is not, however, just a set of treaties and organizations. It is comprised of a vast network of collaborative processes, relationships, guidelines, and monitoring mechanisms, which are all necessary to manage our increasingly complex interdependence. Well, that complex interdependence has been carefully, carefully put together. Again, coming on, I don't know, minimally 200 years. And what is it they're really after? Well, one thing they're after is not having a world where there's voting or any input from the so-called masses. And the things they want to manage that they list here, things like war or pandemics, what do we know about those things? Has anyone ever taken the time to realize the fact? that outlines what war is. I mean, I could cite Smedley Butler or all these other heroes that have been head up that have said things like every war, he was a general, every war I fought in, I was fighting for the wrong side. I should have been fighting a corporation. 
saying things like this. Well, what do we know about war? If we go back to the war I referenced where the whole world shifted on its axis in a day, there was a war with Napoleon. The outcome of that war was intentionally misreported by the bankers to the people with power. Those people dumped their shares and everything else. All that was bought up for literally pennies on the dollar, and then they found out they'd been lied to, and the other side actually won. What we know about wars is they cost a lot of money. So how can it be that if we don't want war in this world, why wouldn't somebody just say, I don't like war? That's wrong. I'm not going to fund it. Well, that's not what we see. But to take that a step further, if you're going to fund a war, you also have the power to decide which side gets funded the most, who you want to win. And in terms of pandemics, what do we need to say? Was that an organic happening? Or was it something else? Now, we can look back in recent history, like we say things like the Victorian age. Well, I'm here to tell you that Queen Victoria was the first British queen of the Rothschilds bloodline. What is the Rothschilds bloodline? They're bankers, right? Now, there are other people out in the world doing fantastic research who will say things like, well, the Rothschilds aren't running the world in America It's this old family, Cologne, related to Christopher Columbus. It's the Collins. Good research. No problem with it. But above and beyond everything or interconnected with everything, you're going to find the bankers that are at the root of what I just mentioned. I will add that it is on the record that Queen Victoria was impregnated by George of Cumberland. Here's where it gets a little dicey because some people won't receive the information very well. Within the royal historians, and I have this on good authority, there's this idea that certain Christian royal bloodlines were of the Jesus bloodline. That supposed marriage or that coupling of George of Cumberland is said to be into the Jesus bloodline. And I'll have more on this later. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, adopted by all United Nations members in 2015, created 17 World Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. They were created with the aim of peace and prosperity for people and the planet, while tackling climate change and working to preserve oceans and forests. The SDGs highlight the strong interconnections between the environmental, social, and economic aspects of sustainable development. Sustainability is at the center of the SDGs. Sustainability is a good thing, right? Well, of course it is. That's why this argument works. But there are precious few things that we can point at on the world stage that aren't taking the rights of living men and women. If sustainability is so important by the powers that be, they're getting ready to reorganize the world. Can we think of anything that damages the environment more than war? They fund that. They allow that to be funded. They participate in it. They have so-called supposedly nuclear weapons, which I call poppycock, but could anything be more destructive to the environment? The problem here is that this is being pushed off on the average human being living where in fact we have very little say on what car we buy, what powers it, whether it's gasoline or something else. So in fact, it is the corporations who are causing the most pollution. If we even choose to accept that the level of global warming or whatever they're calling it this week is in fact the problem they're saying it are is. My point being, if you really wanted to do something like it, you would be going after the biggest manufacturing corporations in the world to figure out a better way to operate. That's a fact. And yet what's actually happening is it's being pushed off on us as if we are responsible just by dint of having been born. Because we were born and there's supposedly 8 billion of us, which I do not accept is correct, we're the problem. It's actually the problem here is the markets and the things that are made in the markets, and that is outside of the control of the people who have been taught to be materialist consumers over time. Now, to put it back around on the banking, because clearly it's this is the same thing above it all, above the corporations who spend money to make things, cars or oil or any of it, 
was the introduction of the petrodollar. That introduction of the petrodollar, which Jason wrote in episode four some time ago, was another world shifting moment. What it allowed was the complete development of the United States because the dollar was tied to the way we move, what we feed our cars and trucks to move around. But keep in mind the petrodollar for the simple reason that that's about to go away now. And people know what it's going to be replaced with, but they're still being fooled into thinking that Russia is our enemy or this this country is our enemy or the Middle East is our enemy. This kind of thinking allows the divisiveness that was introduced with the political parties to get us tied up in fighting about things that really aren't that important while they do all these other things to take steps to take over the world. Now, this is going to come into play with the BRICS nations and everything else, because this is all part of the plan that has been slowly developed over, again, my view, minimally 200 years. The UN 2030 Agenda envisages, quote, a world of universal respect for human rights and human dignity, the rule of law, justice, equality, and non-discrimination. It is grounded in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and International Human Rights Treaties and emphasizes the responsibilities of all states to respect, protect, and promote human rights. There is a strong emphasis on the empowerment of women and of vulnerable groups such as children, young people, persons with disabilities, older persons, refugees, internally displaced persons, and migrants. In other words, people that aren't likely to push back against power. But really, you're going to talk about this is all about human rights. Does anyone remember what happened in 2020, where if you didn't do what you were told, you lose your job, where even though you may have been afraid because you weren't sure you should be doing what you were told because it could be dangerous and you were treated badly, you were held out of work, you were uh, any number of things. Does that sound? like a world governance program that's really focused on human rights. But let me swing it back around. This bloodline that I was referring to earlier is a scheme. It was a scheme to breed the Rothschilds banking dynasty into the Jesus bloodline. And this was referred to as Victoria's Secret. And yes, I'm relating the poke in the eye for the scantily clad clothing line that is named Victoria's Secret. Victoria's actual secret, Queen Victoria's actual secret, is this supposed plot to breed Rothschilds into the supposed Jesus bloodline. Victoria's Secret, the company, was led by a guy named Les Wexler, who was a lackey or whatever you want to say, let's just say friend of Jeffrey Epstein that everyone lost their mind about, who is in fact a Mossad agent, or was, depending on what you choose to believe. And everyone knows what he was doing. They were using pedophilia and blackmail to control everybody, anyone in the public eye, anyone with an audience that would listen to them. And everybody knows this. But what they don't know is it is claimed this was done at the behest of the Rothschilds plan. It is further claimed. And again, some of this can be cited out in the book, The Saudi Swindle, published recently. You can correlate it with the Book of 300 by Coleman. And if you've got a keen eye, even the work of Downard and others kind of shows the game here. Anyhow, the supposed resulting Jesus bloodline was sent into hiding when the 200-year contract for the crown with the Rothschilds dynasty ended. Now you can see where this goes, right? There's going to be a second coming of Jesus. Well, they're leveraging on this idea, however you choose to view the source material. And I'll come back on this in a little bit. The short titles of the 17 SDGs are No Poverty, Zero Hunger, Good Health and Well-Being, Quality Education, Gender Equality, Clean Water and Sanitation, Affordable and Clean Energy, Decent Work and Economic Growth, Industry, Innovation, and Infrastructure, Reduced Inequalities, Sustainable Cities and Communities, 
Responsible consumption and production. Climate action. Life below water. Life on land. Peace, justice, and strong institutions. And partnerships for the goals. Well, I guess there's no life in the air. Oh, wait a minute. Is that the dark prince that has jurisdiction there? I forget. What does the Bible say? But when you see all these things, you're, you're, you're being told this by a group of people that are not elected. You're being told this by people like, what's the guy, what's the guy's name that runs the WEF? The Klaus Schwab. Agent? Isn't he somehow partied into the Nazi party that everyone loves to hate on? Wasn't his father part of that or something? Yeah, I do believe so. Yeah, these are the people. And how did they get there? They got there because rich people with a lot of power and multinational corporations allowed it. They're not voted for. And in the world that I grew up in, in America, the idea was supposed to be you supported and voted for people who provided what you thought was best. Well, from this episode alone, I've shown you how that's infiltrated from the banker's speech to the banking dynasties, to what we're reading you here. Zero hunger. There's already stories about what they're doing with meat and introducing bugs. When you get down to other points like work and economic growth, it doesn't even say good. It says decent. Reduced inequalities. So if you look at a world as an example where there's minorities, they typically make up a very small percentage of the population. And should they be treated well? Everyone in the world should be treated well. But do you skew what 90 or more percent of the world experiences based on that idea? And that's what we see. This is how the Olympics has become so successful, by pushing ideas out to people who aren't necessarily down with the ideas. And why do they do it? Because that's how you begin the normalization. Jason sent me a piece yesterday, which was brilliant. It showed a Led Zeppelin lyric where they were talking about love in the way 60s and 70s rocks talked about women and love, which is also a step down, by the way, from the classic era when it was what much more respectful. But even so, you read that, you're used to it, we've been normalized to it, nothing wrong with it for the most part. And then he put the lyrics that had been pulled from a rap song where people are being referred to as hoes and bitches and all these other things. This is the Overton window moving right. Even though the people that are experiencing this now may think it's atrocious, the way this works is the first time you see something that is shocking, it is shocking. The thousandth time, not so much. And then the people that are born in the time of this introduction, that seems normal to them. Because when they were young, that's what was being presented. This is the normalization process of lowering the minds towards the idiocracy that will be required to implement all the things Jason just read. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development recognizes that migration is a powerful driver of sustainable development for migrants and their communities. It brings significant benefits in the form of skills, strengthening the labor force, investment in cultural diversity, and contributes to improving the lives of communities in their countries of origin through the transfer of skills and financial resources. And so what it does also do is it undermines the customs, the rules, the laws, and the way any given country has been functioning at whatever level up to now. It's directly a way to break down the systems they don't want around anymore. And it's done under a good argument. We should treat everyone well, no matter where they come from. But how we see it implemented, that's a whole other story. Now let me swing back around to the magical bloodline that the Rothschilds married into. And by the way, supposedly the royal historians think this is true, whatever you may or may not think about it. It is claimed that the Rothschild dynasty used the Schofield Bible to come up with the idea of the Jesus return prophecy that they could infiltrate and then rule for a thousand years. That's the plan. They plan to use a Rothschild of the Jesus bloodline to rule the world, which is why they need the third temple to be built 
to rule the world with a Christ figure known to all. And there are very few people in the world who haven't heard that word. The irony in me talking about this now is I'm quite familiar with a number of Bibles, the King James, the NIV, the Geneva, which I really enjoyed, even the Lamsa Bible, which takes a very different direction by a man who claims he grew up in the language Aramaic and that we don't understand things like the idiotism, you know, it'd be easier to go through the eye of a needle. Everyone's familiar with that. He claims you don't understand that at all. It's an idiotism, like saying bats in the belfry. Not that it means the same thing, but it's an idiotism. I've read them all. Ironically, the one I am not familiar with is the Schofield Bible. And I'll be trying to take time to try to realize why it was important to claim that this elaborate plan to rule the world for a thousand years based on infiltrating a bloodline everyone's heard of based on the prophecy that it will go on for a thousand years. In short, if other people know about the Schofield Bible or why it's different, well, then you have some interesting things to talk about. The benefits of migration should not be seen only from the perspective of what migrants can bring to any given territory. The relationship between migration and development is much more complex. The political, social, and economic processes of potential destination countries will also determine how, where, and when migration occurs. If migration is poorly governed, it can also negatively impact on development. Migrants can be put at risk and communities can come under strain. Isn't this just a roundabout way of saying you're all pawns on a chessboard? and we're going to move you where we want you? I mean, because that's what it sounds like to me. Well, here's the thing. If you really start shaking the snow globe up, it's going to destroy national sovereignty because it's just going to be a mishmash of everything. It's kind of crazy, no matter what angle you think of, because any community that's experiencing this is typically not very happy about it. The other problems you can think of are things like, well, what about communities where people don't have services or access to food? And then you're introducing this additional problem and the people don't even speak the language. And by the way, if you take all these migrants from other places that don't speak the language, then over time, how effective are ideas like the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or for that matter, the slip you get handed at the DMV that you've got to comprehend? All that begins to break down, doesn't it? And if we take it back around, we know darn well that there are huge numbers of young people who have not been taught how to handwrite. Well, why would you do that? Well, one thing we learned along the way is AI early on had trouble parsing handwriting. The other thing we know is all those founding documents, guess what? Ain't none of them printed. So what you're basically saying is you're bringing up a generation of children and the migrants who don't even speak the language in the first place or have any cultural tie to the idea of what founded this supposed beacon of liberty, and they will not be able to even read directly the founding documents and ideas and bills of rights and other things, which have been so important to put on the news or into the political system. Remember when Obama ran, Obama ran we were told, what was it, that he was a constitutional scholar from Harvard? I don't know if I got that exactly right, but that was not that long ago. And here we are coming up to a point where there's a generation coming online where if they want to know what the Constitution actually says, they have to take someone's word for it because they can't read the original document. And we won't even mention what position that puts a person who doesn't speak the language or really care about that cultural construct because they grew up in a place that was very different and their values were very different. Now to switch back to the in-between story that we're telling, since this entire thing is run from above by bankers, well, at this point, by multinational corporations, part of the Schofield Bible plan of getting a Rothschild supposedly into the Jesus bloodline to be magically appear for a second coming of some sort and then rule the world for a thousand years is the built-in idea of Armageddon. And the way that it was written, some of the ways I run that is the people who survive emerge from like underground or something like this. So, you know, everyone's aware of what the Armageddon idea is. How does that bounce off what we're talking about? If you see where I'm going here, 
The following definitions for ESG and DEI are taken from mainstream sources that seem to think these concepts are a good idea. While on the surface, at least some of these might sound like you're being nice to people, the fact is they are being used in ways that not only radically imbalance things in a particular company just for the sake of ticking checkboxes, they are actually damaging to that company's profit margin, sometimes to a very significant degree. The purpose of a company is to make money for its shareholders, and these concepts go distinctly against the notion of making money. And here comes the new world. Well said, Jason. What happened to Budweiser? Was that a company that made decisions based on the need to make money, which is the reason they exist, which means that they have to have a customer base, which means theoretically that you should be serving the wants and needs at some level of the customer base, or did something other entirely happen that was destructive to its ability to do what corporations do since the beginning of time, if they're a for-profit corporation. They were basically told, I imagine, you will put out this point of view or you will be penalized in some way for having not done it. And I think you could take it a step further where maybe even the officers of the corporation were bought into the ideas. But it is pretty clear that the people, those ideas that were aimed at weren't down with it at all. I forget the numbers that we were told. Was it billions of dollars, Jason? Do you even remember? It was a lot of money, whatever it was. Yes. It was a 30% market share, if I remember correctly, is what they ended up losing in the long run. 20 years ago, a major brand like Budweiser reporting a 20% drop would have been skyrocket news on Wall Street. Would have been a big deal. It's not anymore. People are being directed to do things simply because of an idea and a message that most people are not interested into, many people are being upset by. And why is it going this way? Again, never forget the Overton window, the normalization of that, which is shocking. And by the way, a good friend of mine who comes on the episode that everyone loves to listen to once told me, and I looked into it after the fact, and I think he's probably spot on, he usually is, said there is no culture that has descended wholesale into hedonism that has ever recovered from it. Now to pull over to the ancillary story we're telling here. It is claimed, and this is cited from the books I have mentioned, the royal historians claim that all of Queen Victoria's kids are Rothschilds and were presumably fathered by Nathan Rothschild. It is claimed by the royal historians, all the kids were then married into royal Christian families. It is claimed by this study, and part of this is referenced and cited in the book, The Saudi Swindle, I believe, is that after they were married into those Christians, some of them holy, because they're claiming the Jesus bloodline, Those families were then destroyed, and it even goes on to say that assassination occurred. The reason being that any of these supposed holy royal bloodlines could have been a threat to the takeover being perpetrated. So just to look at things from a common sense point of view, the point of any business from the mom and pop shop all the way up to a giant corporation is to know who your customer base is, what it is that they want, and to sell it to them for as reasonable a price as possible while still having a healthy profit margin. This nonsense that they've been doing is pretty much the antithesis of that. Right. I mean, look at branding. What is the idea of branding? Does branding have anything to do with the actual product you're buying? It does if you want to include perception, because that's what branding is about. It is an idea It is a perception. It is designed to get you to act favorably towards something that you might not have otherwise. Like I'm a cowboy and I live a cowboy lifestyle. I have a ranch, I have cows and there's cowboy branding. I relate to that. So that's where I'm going to spend my money. The branding has completely been purposefully destroyed. All those years of building a brand, which is a perception of a company or a product, was just thrown right out the window. 
And it doesn't take a genius to comprehend what 20 or 30% of a market share means to any co company, let alone a company of that size. That is a lot of money. And it was done apparently unconcerned at any level with money making. The messaging seemed to have been the only thing that mattered. And the other thing to keep in mind is if a company went in a direction like that and lost that sizable amount of money in more common sense times, there would be the proverbial heads that would roll. CEOs and other executives would be held accountable for that and probably be thrown out on their pompous asses. You know, it's terrible when you begin to get the eyes that see how we got here. As an example, if we go back to, I think it's the 90s, and we see what was being shown in mass media then. I noticed the other day, uh, as I was reading my local paper, the Deadwood, they announced the, I think it's HBO, is it HBO or Cinemax? I don't know. It's one of those. Deadwood was a very, very popular Western kind of Deadwood. It was about Deadwood, you know, Wild Bill Hillcock and all that, American mythology. It's about that. I think it did three seasons, maybe a little more, but then it ended abruptly. Later they came, I think, with a movie to try to tie up all the ends. But back in the day, we actually saw some of that. And there are precursors to the pandemic in that, where the Black Plague hits. And this is the Overton window. But when you're watching it in the context of how it was displayed back then, it doesn't seem obtrusive. Most people will never consider it as programming on any level, but it is. And the level at which and the sneaky way it's being introduced has no impact whatsoever other than maybe moving the Overton window until we get up to 2020 and we begin to look back at how these ideas have been brought to us over time. It's been going on for hundreds of years, the queue up to what we see. ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. ESG investing refers to how companies score on these supposedly responsibility metrics and standards for potential investments that they are being looked at for. Environmental criteria gauge how a company safeguards the environment with its practices. Social criteria examines how it manages relationships with communities customers, employees, and suppliers. Governance measures a company's audits, executive pay, internal controls, leadership, and shareholder rights. Companies have to keep a good ESG score for the major investment firms to look favorably upon them when they are looking for large sums of money for future endeavors. So let me ask a simple question. Who the hell gave you the authority to come into a supposedly free market country, or at least that's what we've been told this was built on, and regulate the way they choose to do business? Who gave you that power? You show me the authority that allows you to do this. I'm being facetious, of course. What's the authority that allows them to do this? They control the money. They have all the power in the world. They're backed by the biggest bankers that have ever been and the biggest multinational corporations that have ever been. And now we begin to realize why a place like Budweiser did what it did. Could they have been brave and stood up against it? It's a shame they didn't. But I'm guessing they felt like they were between a rock and a hard place. But what would have happened had people actually gone back to the supposed port systems here, like we covered all those people who were illegally let go? because they didn't do what they were told, didn't allow their rights to be trampled on. I mean, the vast majority of them have won their cases. And maybe we just simply don't hear about how many corporations tried to stand their ground and protect their rights. It's a hard thing to know. The main point is, who the hell made you Lord Emperor Bufu? Because that's what's going on here. Now to pull it back around, the royal historians further claim, getting back to the Rothschild story that I've been telling in between by the cited sources I have laid down, the royal historians claim that assassins were used to kill the sacred bloodlines that were left over once the intermarriage has happened. It is claimed by these sources that that cleared the way to global rule so there would be no contenders. 
That's crazy to think about. And as I was reading this and the sighting that was done, I thought if I could figure out who the supposed secret holy royal bloodlines were, would I find a lot of assassinations? And then I stepped back and said, you know what? I'm not going to waste my life on this. I'll report on what I think is well cited. But think about what this means when all the multinationals are basically controlled, the big ones. Some people say three or four of them are controlling everything from above. I think it's one or two. But then think about what it means if this is all true and they married into the royalty, then they married into their secret, victorious secret bloodlines, and they're playing it off the religiously held values of, I don't know, could we say the majority of the world? Certainly a major, major part of the world. When we think about the people who supposedly discovered what the Bavarian Illuminati supposedly set up in 1776, their plan, they wept. Some of them killed themselves saying there's nothing that can be done to stop this. And it makes me wonder, is this part of why they thought that? Anyhow, back to you, Jason. To break down those three points further, environmental investors evaluate corporate climate policies, energy use, waste, pollution, natural resource conservation, and treatment of animals. Considerations may include direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions, management of toxic waste, and compliance with environmental regulations. Social, a company's relationships with internal and external stakeholders are evaluated. Does the company donate a percentage of profits to the local community or encourage employees to volunteer? Do workplace conditions reflect a high regard for employees' health and safety? And governance ensures a company uses accurate and transparent accounting methods, pursues integrity and diversity in selecting its leadership, and is accountable to shareholders. ESG investors may require assurances that companies avoid conflicts of interest in their choice of board members and senior executives, don't use political contributions <laughs> to obtain preferential treatment, or engage in illegal conduct. We are talking about iron-fisted control against every corporation or company or marketplace that doesn't even matter that much on the world stage. When you start to say, we will look at who you choose for your board members, we will look at who you're hiring and whether or not you're trying to get them to do the things we want. And by the way, above it all is this environmental idea. The problem with the environmental idea is it's a lot like COVID. If you question it, you're not allowed to question it. And I've grown up in a world where I have learned if I question a thing, isn't that my right? I'm not harming anyone. I don't harm people. I state openly that I live my life with every effort to do no harm to anyone, to include animals, by the way. But if I question the environmental global warming narrative, why do I get treated in a similar manner as when people wanted to shoot things into my body and I questioned that? There's a problem here because when you state that this is all open and for the well-being, at what cost? At the cost of my rights as a living man with the divine spark granted the rights I have by the divine? And you're telling me that I can't question what's going on or look to try to evaluate whether it's true? This is a scary, scary time. Luckily, I know as we roll up on the end of the first hour here, but all created things will see their end. Luckily, I know to the core of my being that this world was not meant to be the plaything of dark minds. Nonetheless, we're in this period of change. And how do I know for certain? Because I look at the sun. And what do I see from the light of this world? I see change at a level which is, it fascinates me beyond anything I can describe to anyone who would listen to me. I see activity at a level that just makes everything else I've ever seen minuscule. It is reflecting in the light of this world, the rapid change, which we see down here. But if I go back to the counter story that I've been telling you from cited sources, they're claiming that these people tapped into the religious concerns of the world 
to try to infiltrate and take over at a level that is shocking, are they leveraging off also the known era shift? Do they know what the sun is telling us? Did they have the ancient records that flat out state, look, this era is not like this era. In this age, these energies will be prevalent. And I think it sure feels that way. But Jason, we're coming up on the hour. You want to throw anything in before we take our short break? So there's a lot more to break down here. When we come back for hour two, we're going to open up with some facts about what real world consequences have occurred to at least one very major corporation that everyone will be familiar with, which is Disney, to instituting these ESG policies. And when we are going over these three points, it's very laughable that they're saying that they're trying to be accountable to shareholders. Being accountable to your shareholders is doing the most you can to maximize profits. And that is exactly the opposite of what we've been seeing going on with companies who go down this path. Typically in the past, maximizing profit was at the expense of everyone else around. It's about controlling those. But I want want to make a, a solid point here as we wrap up hour one. In my view, no better book. And this is so subjective what I'm telling you. I say, I'm going to say this, but if I look at entertainment of a genre, the book I'm about to mention is at the highest level. I don't see anything else in the ballpark. And it's fiction, by the way. That book is Dune. Everybody knows that the Dune movie was just made. Now, I took some time here to show you that supposedly there's a banking cartel at the top levels of power in the world that have supposedly married into a holy royal bloodline who are supposedly going to use the religious narratives of the Christian world to introduce a second coming of their agent, the Armageddon and all that's wrapped up in the prophecies of the Christian religion are going to be tapped into, Dune just showed you the same thing, didn't it? I read the book, but they've even included that portion in the movie. So of all the things they changed for the movie and all the things they left out, because flat out, you can't include everything in a book in a movie, what they did is they show flat out that there are some young women who are telling the older men Quit falling for this religious fervor nonsense. The Benny Gesserit witches introduced this. They're even confirmed by the son of the Benny Gesserit that, yep, that's exactly true. When I read the series of Dune for the first time, I have never seen a more clever fiction delivered way to describe how the gears work in our world. Even making up names like the Benny Jesuit, which is clearly the Jesuit order with, you know, the gender switch and stuff, but they show you what is done. And they included in that book, which was in around the centers of power that the author of that book can be shown to be part of the world communication center. I think that the takeover of the planet Arrakis is being implemented by asserting that Paul is the Messiah. There it is. You want to add anything, Jason? Well, when you look at the story of Dune, really, it's just a very large, corrupt monarchy, I guess, is what the main house was supposed to be, setting up another house to be wiped off the face of their political spectrum. And that's really all it was. Dirty deals were done, setups occurred, and murders are what went down. Almost sounds how the Jewish people feel they were treated supposedly centuries ago, right? Everyone against them being treated poorly. That's the claim. Anyhow, I'm just saying that this thing that I've just read, as I was doing the research and trying to get citations and figure out who had put these ideas down, and then calling up some people I know who actually know something about these things, accepting that I know enough to put it out there, the using of a religion to further a world takeover is built into the story. Yet another thing that mirrors our world, if everything I have read here is correctly reported on. But with that, I'm going to wrap up hour one of episode 591. Hour hour one is free to everybody at pro777radio.com. The web address is crrow777radio.com. 